Yes. 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 The thunderous fall of the dual Arjun trees brought all Gokula to the spot to see. But when the children said how it was done, great disbelief overcame everyone. Those who believed commended child Krishna to his father, Nanda Maharaj Nanda, who picked up his supernal boy with pride and smilingly praised while the rope untied. The gopis circled all around in joy, heaping accolades on this special boy. Then darling child Krishna, by their love entranced, clapped his small lotus hands, sang songs and danced. Sometimes Yashoda, standing in the yard, would ask Krishna to bring her sitting board. Though the plank was too heavy for a child, he tried anyway and lovingly smiled. Nanda, while praying to Lord Narayan, asked Krishna to please flet, f fetch his slippers young. And though to a child were heavy as lead, Krishna brought them there, balanced on his head. One day a vendor came with fruit to trade. Krishna had often seen transactions made, so he took a little grain in his hand and went out to barter with the man. The vendor was so struck by Krishna's charm, he took the grains, loaded fruit in his arm. Some folk would say such deals are made by fools, but the vendor then found his fruits were jewels. Whatever one gives to the Supreme Lord is then gained back many times in reward. In truth, all things are owned by God above. There is naught to give him save, save heartfelt love. When Krishna and Balaram were at play with their mates on the river bank one day, Rohini called the two to come and eat, but they much preferred playing in the street. After a while, Mother Jashoda came to call them home, but they played on the same. Your father will not eat until you've, you're there, she said disrespect for him is unfair. This argument then won their hearts, it seemed. But when starting to leave, their playmates, their playmates screamed, Please, Krishna, stay and play. We want you to. If you leave, we'll not again play with you. When he sat down like any five-year-old, Yashoda grabbed him and began to scold. Krishna, do you think you are a street boy? Have you no home or parents to enjoy? Look at your clothes. The other boys are clean. Come home and take a bath. Don't be so mean. When you're clean, you can come again to play. And besides, today is your own birthday. You should come home and give away some cows to the Brahmins, if Lord Vishnu allows. And before there was need of more to say, Krishna and Balaram were on the way. At home, the two of them were bathed and dressed, and chants were sung for that day to be blessed. And cows were duly given in charity, a custom of much popularity. Not long after that day, Upananda, who was the brother of Maharajananda, brought to the attention of the herdsmen the frequency of demons in their glen. He said that perhaps the village should move, a suggestion to which all did prove. They moved thereupon to Bindaman, 
quite nearby to the hill of Govardhan. A bower near the river Jamuna seemed the best site to locate Gokula. Thus, each cowherd man with his darling spouse picked out a spot for building a new house. From there, each day, Balaram and Krishna pastured the cows along the Jamuna. And there, with other boys who did the same, they ran and jumped and played many a game. While they happily played games between themselves, a strange yearling mi mingled there with the calves. Neiman Vatasura was the real name of that new calfling who amongst them came. Before this demon could effect his plan, he was detected by Krishna's sharp scan. For he had seen, while he was still afar, that he was different from what real calves are. So Krishna snuck behind this imposter and grabbed his legs before he could counter. Krishna then tossed him up into a tree. From thence, he fell down as dead as could be. Another time, a duck, big as a hill, tried to pinch Lord Krishna in his long bill. But Krishna quick bifurcated his beak as fast as one splits grass from base to peak. And on each occasion of such wondrous feat, the demigods, who were always discreet, and watching from behind each white cloud, cast flowers down and sang their praises loud. The cowboys who heard this celestial sound and saw the flowers dropping all around marveled at these happenings wherever they'd play, wherever they'd roam, and talked about them when they were back home. The gopis and the cowherd men would cheer each time the children said for them to hear the wondrous exploits of this cowherd boy whose holy presence brought them so much joy. They often would wonder how Lord Hari did save this special boy from injury and how the demons seemed to drop like flies wherever the wonderful Krishna cast his eyes. Remembering that once Gargamuni had predicted by his astrology that demons would often attack the Lord, they thanked God sincerely with one accord. The residents of Vrindavan, whether cowherd boys and girls, merchants or parents, simply loved Krishna and were charmed with his superhuman activities. And his pastimes always brought welfare to his devotees, as seen in the Street Bender episode, for Krishna is always controlled and subject to the desires of his pure devotees. The pure devotees, however, are only thinking of Krishna's welfare as seen in the discussion of Gokula's elders concerning moving because of all the demons in that place. Actually, there are demons everywhere in this material world, but wherever Krishna is, the demons are exposed. This is one of the reasons Krishna descends to this world, to expose and annihilate demons. It was interesting to note how easily the residents of Gokula moved. They simply packed a few belongings on an ox cart and within a few hours were in their new homes. It reminds one of the admonition of Lord Jesus to take no thought for what we eat or where we sleep or what we put on, but seek first the kingdom of God and his pure devotional service and all other things will come automatically. Vatasura represents the fourth obstacle on the path of pure devotion, the juvenile offense. Persons who are neglectful of spiritual direction are subject 
to the frailties and inconsistencies that characterized infant children. Despite the demon's disguise, Krishna detected the presence of this imposter by comparison to the reality which he imitated. A serious devotee must judge and be guided by the infallible rule of Guru Sadhu and Shastra. Mental speculation is always an obstacle but by comparison to the genuine, known by the testimony of the discipular succession. Success is guaranteed. Bakasura, the fifth obstruction on the path of pure devotion, represents religious hypocrisy. Often those who fall under the influence of a false guru deceive themselves and others by imitating a higher level of worship than that to which they have realization. We are especially referring to those persons who realize their lack of qualification but still persist in the imitation worship for the sake of material prestige and gain. Thus they commit the sin of religious hypocrisy. Under the banner of exclusivist sectarianism and pseudo-renunciation, these hypocrites deceive the world with their show of piety in pretentious rites and rituals, but they do not impress or please Krishna. We are not thereby demeaning external acts of piety, but the true devotee must be careful to understand how the external act furthers the internal essence of worship, devotion to God. It is therefore the duty of every sincere devotee to be detached in regard to external acts. We are neither attached to nor repulsed by them, but seek only to understand what furthers the goal of pure devotion to the Lord. <coughs> 